I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, absent this evening um, is uh, Chad Rittenauer and Lee Schimmick. Um, and Todd uh, Sorensen will be joining us um, in a few minutes. He'll be a little bit late. Um, approval of agenda. Um, I'd like to make one um, change to the new business. Um, I'd like to move uh, C to G um, and basically just move everything up after C uh, by one. Uh, can I get a motion with the amended agenda? I'll make that motion. Uh, Rich, second? I'll second it. Second, Mike. All those in favor say aye. 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 That passes 4-0. Uh, consent agenda. Uh, the, cons the consent agenda items are considered to be routine in nature and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a board member or citizen so requests, um, in which event the item will be removed. All right, uh, the check wire transfer, the bank reconciliation, the approval of the school board minutes for the regular school board meeting on October 13th, the study session on October 27th, uh, resignations, terminations, and non-renewals as listed. Uh, do I have a motion for the consent agenda? So moved. Dan, second? <coughs> I'll second the motion. Second by Rich. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 4-0. Uh, resolution of the acceptance of gifts. Uh, whereas the following have generously offered to donate to the Prior Lake Savage Area Schools, uh, $50 from Mark and Jessica Fontana for Hidden Oaks. Um, that is it for this evening. Um, do I have a motion to approve? I'm sorry, is this roll call? Yeah, roll call, absolutely. okay. Um, do I have a motion to approve the uh, resolution I'll, for- I'll, I'll make the motion. Thank you, Mike. Second? I'll second the motion. Rich, this is a roll call, Rich? Aye. Aye. Dan? Aye. Mike? Aye. That passes 4-0. Uh, there is no Laker Pride this evening. Uh, moving on to the open forum. It's a 15-minute time period set aside to receive citizen in th input through the open forum segment. Um, does anyone have anything that they'd like to address the board on this evening that's not listed on the agenda? Seeing none, um, we go on to personal items and Matt. All right, good evening, members of the board, Dr. Groover. Um, first off, I would like to recommend the following candidates for employment and I'm seeking board approval. Okay. Do I have a motion um, for the candidates for employment? So moved. Dan, second? I'll second the motion. Rich, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 4-0. And next, I present the following leaves of absence. Do I have a motion for the leaves of absence? So moved. Dan, second? I'll second the motion. Rich, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 4-0. And next, I have uh, an additional staffing request. Both of these requests would take effect uh, in the current school year. And the first of which is for an additional FTE at Bridges ALC. Um, due to student enrollment, which has gotten up to 94 students, they're in need of, uh, of more instructional time. And just a note too, this is a similar student count to where we ended last year, and this would bring us back up to the FTE that we had last year. And then the second edition being requested is for a new position, Community Education Services, that would uh, to some degree supplant an existing position 
and that's for a facilities coordinator as offerings in community ed have expanded and our facilities have expanded as well there's a need for uh, more management in that area and to ensure that we have somebody on call beyond a traditional eight-hour work day and uh, that's why we're bringing that recommendation forward you can see that it's a little uh, lower cost than you would normally associate with a full-time position that's because there are savings to be gleaned by not replacing uh, part of the previous position and with that I am seeking board approval uh, is there any questions on that right now okay uh, do I have a motion to approve the ad additional staffing requests so moved uh, rich second second by Dan all those in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed that passes four zero and then lastly on behalf of both the educational support staff negotiations committee and also the uh, license negotiation committee I uh, have the following recommendations for um, terms and uh, agreement for terms and conditions of employment and I'm seeking board approval Uh, do I have a motion to approve uh, the agreements uh, for 2014-2016 as listed? So moved. Dan, second. By Mike. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. That passes 4-0. Um, okay, on to old business. Um, there is none. And so now we are on to new business. Uh, the 2013-14 final audit report. Julie and Dennis, I believe. Good evening, board, Dr. Groover. Tonight we will have our audit report by Clifton Larson Allen. Dennis Hogeveen, um, a principal for Clifton Larson Allen, is here to present um, the findings from our audit. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, we met with the full board and um, subset of the board a couple of weeks ago as I recall it's maybe as long as that ago but um, we spent over an hour about an hour and 15 minutes as I recall between the two meetings to go over things in detail um, and so tonight we're just going to do the high, high level overview of that for, for public information using just an extraction of that data out of those some 160 or so pages of um, fascinating government government school finance <laughs> reports but um, to the extent you have questions as we go through this, uh, please don't hesitate to let me know. And um, otherwise, we'll just kind of kick off things here and um, kind of go this for this fairly quickly. Like I said, we have reviewed it in a lot of detail at the board level already. So um, the thing that you're hiring an auditing firm to do is to give an opinion. And here in uh, Prior Lake Public Schools, you are using uh, putting together a CAFR. So a CAFR is intended to convey to the public that you're holding yourself to a much higher you know reporting standard in terms of the amount of detail and the amount of information that's in your financial statement so CAFR is a comprehensive annual financial report and um, it is a useful tool for bond ratings and things like that when you do debt issuances and things like that that um, there's a lot of great historical information there so we encourage you know the public that might be interested in that to download that off of your website but the thing that you're hiring an auditing firm to do is to give an opinion on the accuracy and the uh, fairness of those financial statements so we have issued a um, clean or an unmodified audit report so it's as good of an audit report as we're able to give any Minnesota school district and then because we're following government auditing standards we're required to give an opinion on called the yellow book opinion um, that's um, where we would note if there were issues related to laws regula regulations contracts and grants but we had nothing to report in terms of that particular aspect of that report and then we're also issuing an opinion on your internal controls as part of that yellow book opinion and um, as in past years we did issue one material weakness related to the drafting of the financial statements and then one control deficiency which was defined as a significant deficiency which is less than a material weakness related to a different matter related to some approval of it, food service invoices um, unless you want to go back into the detail of those um, I feel like I'm just going to mention the, what the report was and then to the extent um, you know we've we've covered them in detail as far as what the outcomes of those were and what the corrective action plans were as a, as a full board so um, I think all of those are available to people if they may have an interest in what those underlying details were and then because you expended more than five hundred thousand dollars of federal funding in 2014 we had to do a single audit um, for this year we uh, tested the special education cluster and the child nutrition cluster 
as a result of all that testing, which is very significant in relationship to the amount of funding that, that the school gets, um, it's disproportionate <coughs> amount of audit effort that's required for in relationship to the funding. But we did find one issue with an IEP meeting that hadn't been hadn't occurred within the required um, statutory time period. So um, we also put together a legal <coughs> compliance opinion based on a number of um, statutory guidances that are put together by the Office of the State Auditor. We had two minor compliance issues that were noted with respect to the legal compliance opinion. And then because you uh, choose to not have your student activity accounts under board control, that's <coughs> required by department rules, Minnesota Department of Education rules to have a separate standalone audit. So your extracurricular student activity report, um, we gave it a, the, the normal opinion. Um, there were no compliance issues for us to report as part of your student activity audit. And as I said, all of those are available, I believe, on the district's website for download if anyone ha would have an interest in the particular details of those. So then in terms of financial results, of course, the main thing that the school board is often interested in is the, um, the general fund of the school district because programmatically it's the, uh, the fund where most of the decisions that a school board makes are occurring. So again, I like this particular summary of the, of the audit if you told me to explain the audit in one page, it would look something like this because it tells us where you started the year what your budget to actual outcomes were and revenues and expenditures and then on where you ended the year. So we always tend to draw your attention back up to that unassigned level of the fund balance because everything else has a string attached to it typically or a purpose attached to it. So in terms of your general fund, you started the year with $4.6 million of general fund unassigned fund balance. That was 7% of expenditures on that top line. And you ended the year a very healthy 7.7% at five point, just under 5.5 .5 million there you can see. And then the other categories there, um, as you go down, you, you're a district that does a very good job of, of assigning fund balance and setting things aside for specific purposes. And I think that's, that's a good intended use of, of resources. It doesn't tie your hands. It doesn't you know, require you to spend it in the way that it was assigned at the end of the year, but that was your statement of purpose at that point in time. And so I think, again, it it's a, does a good job of setting aside specific resources for understandable reasons. And then the section under restricted is where the legislature likes to attach a string to a particular type of funding. And then under UFARS, it's required to be set aside and spent in a, in a specific way with a specific account code attached to it to track its, its use. And so um, sometimes you end up with a negative balance in a restricted account to the extent there's future levy authority, like health and safety, for example. It's just the timing of when the projects occur. And so you can end up with, in this case, nearly a $750,000 negative balance. But to the extent you follow through and file the paperwork with the Department of Ed, that levy authority will bring that balance back to zero over time if you were to not have future health and safety projects. So again, um, you started the year in total fund balance just under 13 million, and you ended the year with fund balance in total at just under 13 million. So again, um, a very commendable outcome because you're also able to send some resources over to your OPEB um, fund as well. So in terms of budget to actual outcomes, you can look at the bottom line there. The general fund audit revenues were budgeted at just under 70 million. They came in at just under 71 million for a variance of about 1.56%. And again, on a $71 million <coughs> budget to come in with a you know a percentage and a half is a very good, very good outcome. And the fact that it came out higher, slightly higher than the budget is, is just kind of a bonus. So on the expenditure side, you can see that the board approved budget had expenditures at 72.4 million. They came in just under 71 million for a variance of 1.7 million or 2.3%. But as we um, dig into the details of that, and we'll see that a little bit later, and um, in terms of that variance, um, 1.3 million of that 1.6 million dollar variance all relates to capital items that just hadn't occurred by the end of the year, and the rest of it, um, if you go under the line item uh, under C, there for assigned site carryover, that 416 thousand would have been budgeted for site administrators to expend. But um, again, you don't want to necessarily, as a board, have a use it or lose it policy. So to the extent it was in the budget and was available to be spent, and then um, at the end of the year when it becomes something that's carried over to 2015, it shows up as a, a net variance on the, the expenditures at the, on the bottom line there. So again, very explainable in terms of the 2.3% really is no variance whatsoever because of the fact that it's very identifiable to the capital that wasn't expended and then also the site carryovers that weren't needed. So very, very healthy 
you know, position that you've got the board in. You've made some great decisions over these recent years, and it's now reflected in a very um, positive outcome on your ending fund balance of your general fund. The next slide is just looking at your food service program and your community service program. And again, you started the year with $482,000 in your food service fund balance. Again, ended the year with 579,000. So an increase of about 99,000 for the end of the year, which is about just under $100,000 better than had been reflected in the ending budget. So um, good outcomes in terms of uh, the food service program. Community Ed, again, continues to operate on a very sound financial base. And again, uh, Community Ed's an interesting fund because that is all based on what your public is willing to uh, support you in terms of the programs that you're offering and the types of offerings that you're offering to your community. Again, um, you're going to have some years and make some strategic capital investments and that you know might bring your fund balance down a little bit one year or something. You're very deliberate about that, though, in terms of wanting to keep your ending fund balance at about 25% uh, or less of the expenditures in that fund. So, again, um, the fact that it declined slightly, <laughs> excuse me, is of no concern whatsoever because it was very deliberate. The next slide just looks at the uh, components of the total building fund. Again, you have a lot of alt, alt facility activity flowing through that fund. Of the $10 million, just almost $11 million of ending fund balance, uh, nearly half of that is alt facilities money that will be spent down on specific projects that you've got already plans for, and then the rest is um, building construction uh, fund balance that, again, will be spent for its intended purpose as a result of bond bond offerings. So, again, um, the, it's not available for any other purpose. It's got to be used for the intended purpose for which it was levied or um, debt was issued for it. In terms of the debt service fund, you've got an operating component of that, and, again, you... Uh, had a slight spend down of those ending fund balances in the operating portion of your debt service fund by using some available resources in fund balance to contribute towards the payoff of some existing debt. Um, the other thing that you did was issued some refunding bonds that, again, money is not available to be used programmatically. It's sitting off, in it, off the books, really, in, um, in an escrow account waiting for the refunding um, date to occur at some point in the future. And so those resources will result in a significant tax savings to your local taxpayer. So it's always good to be watchful and be mindful of what those opportunities are to refinance debt. And um, it's a significant savings, as I said, to the taxpayers here. The OPEB revocable trust, you're able to add about $1.2 million to that fund, again, to fund those future liabilities that you're going to have for those post-employment benefits. And then um, your um, self-insurance activity, both dental and medical, um, is, is occurring as planned, you know, in terms of setting aside resources and maintaining a more um, constant rate of change in terms of your um, insurance contributions that are required to, to fund that self-insurance program. In terms of enrollment for the year, this trend shows the last five years, um, the in most interesting thing that I find in this thing is the success that the district has had in terms of attracting open enrollment students into the district. For the first time in 2014, you had open enrollment students out, residents opting out of at 799.29, but you had 814.24 non-residents opting into the district. So um, that generated some great discussion um, at the board level as far as what types of things was manifesting itself in those kind of outcomes. So it's very, very positive in terms of the Good job that's happening here to attract students to, to Prior Lake schools. In terms of the next slide is just a five-year overview of the revenues and expenditures in the ending fund balance. So you can see back to 2010, the unassigned fund balance was under 2%. And again, those outcomes don't just happen. They're a result of deliberate choices and the support of your public here in, in Prior Lake. So again, very commendable outcomes in terms of where you've been able to um, rebuild fund balance and set aside resources for future plans of the district as you continue to grow. In terms of general fund revenue sources over the last five years, um, we had a good discussion regarding some of the things that the legislature does to um, when the state's economy turns south um, as far as the accounting thing, um, transactions that they have us record as part of the audit to avoid outright cuts in funding in, in the years when the state doesn't have enough resources to continue to pay. So you can see in 2010 to 2011, it looked 
you know, there's a $4.7 million increase in local property taxes, but again, we always want to remind people that that did not manifest itself in a tax increase to your local taxpayers. That was simply an accounting uh, entry that is given to us by the Department of Ed to avoid um, outright cuts to funding in years when the state's economy goes south. So what they take, what they give you and to tell you to recognize in property taxes in 2011 was about 4.7 million, but it was a re offsetting redu reduction to your state aid. Um, and also in that year, it got a little bit confused with um, what had occurred with federal resources in the prior year as well. So anyway, that reversed itself in 2014, where you can see in, from 2013 to 2014, that 4.7 million reversed itself, and they basically, that's called the buy-down of the tax shift, and they give you all your cash back. And again, when you're reading in the newspaper, sometimes it gets confusing because it sounds like it's new money flowing into education that the legislature is using money, but all they're really doing is giving the cash back that they had taken away from you three years earlier. So again, it's very important. And for in the executive audit summary, there's more of an expanded discussion around that. And the explanation kind of summarizes by saying, for all these reasons, it's very difficult to, to explain school finance to the, to, to the public because of all these things that happen that affect the the numbers in such a way as what we just discussed. In terms of expenditures per student, it's just not not the only way to look at the expenditure side of the equation, but it is an interesting one because, again, as you've grown and things like that, you've implemented some new programming, particularly in 2014. You can see most of that increase is related to the implementation of the QCOMP program, and that's partially funded by state funding and also partially by local levy resources. So again, that was a significant expansion of, of that program, but again, it did have a funding source and that's um, both a revenue and a expenditure component to it as far as providing the funding for that QCOMP program. The next slide is just looking at expenditures again from a different way. If you took the entire general fund and, and categorized it in six different lines. You'd have salaries, benefits, purchase services, et cetera. And again, what your auditor, as your auditor always interested in are the budget to actual outcomes for salaries and benefits because those are the most significant um, area of your costs, of course, in terms of the general fund. And again, you can see on your salary line item there, um, you budgeted salaries, salaries at 40 million. They came in at 40 million for a net variance of about 179,000 or 0.4%. So in our world, in the auditing world, that's a very good outcome, very, very positive in that. The net bottom line was a, a final board approved budget of 72.4 million and actual came in at 70.8 million for a variance of 1.666 million. And again, if you look at the fourth, fifth line down, capital expenditures, that's really all related to timing of when the projects could get completed. If they didn't get completed by June 30th, um, those expenditures will flow into, into the next year typically. Um, but of the 1.6 million, you can see 1.3 of it relates to specifically the capital and the rest of the variance all relates to that site carryover line that we talked about earlier. Um, so a net variance of 2.3, but again, once you factor out the things that we know were uh, timing differences like site carryover and capital, it's, it's remarkably close in terms of that bottom line. And again, um, very consistent over these last number of years where um, as a board, you're getting very good information upon which to make decisions. You know, you're not getting to the end of the year and having any sort of meaningful surprises, just coming out as planned, and that's what you want as board members, no surprises. Food service fund, again, um, the ending fund balance of 579000 was about 16.2% of expenditures. Um, again, uh, many, num many districts struggled in their food service program in 2014 because of implementing the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act and things like that and how it manifested itself in terms of menus and things like that. So any district that was able to increase the bottom line um, was actually quite commendable because it was a very challenging year. Um, we do give you a subtotal of total meals served here. And again, um, we've had school, met suburban school districts that had decreases in total meals served of up to 5% just because they really struggled with um, meeting those new requirements and, and, and finding a way to get kids to eat the, the revised um, meal program. In terms of community service fund, continues to be very strong financially. You've done a great job over these last five years of, of turning that fund around and building up the fund balance. Um, Again, we've already talked about the fact that it's a choice that your public is making. It, you know, they're not required to participate in community ed programming. So they, to the extent you are running a program with a 
healthy fund balance that's providing resources available for capital needs of that program to take pressure off your general fund, just as the food service program is another way of having uh, funds available for capital needs of that program that takes pressure off your general fund. And again, very positive outcome. Tells a great story of that uh, you're doing good things that people are wanting to participate in here. Those are the things that I had noted, I guess, again, as we spent over an hour going over the, uh, the, the three documents that we're issuing tonight. But um, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have for me. We sincerely appreciate the opportunity to work with the district. Um, we've developed a great working relationship with the staff and sincerely appreciate all the hard work that Michelle and uh, the finance team and, of course, Julie put into the audit process. They do a really outstanding job of working with our, our team of auditors. and. They're very responsive and very conscientious about responding to our request for information, very um, very timely and very organized, and just do a really commendable job of, of getting ready for that audit process. So we, we appreciate all the hard work very much. Are there any questions for me? Okay. So? Okay. We need to approve this, correct? Um, do I have a motion to approve the final audit for 2013-14? So moved. Dan, second? I'll second the motion. Rich, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 4-0. Thank you, Thanks Dennis. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay. Jim is up, I think, next with approval to advertise for bid. Good evening, Madam Chair, School Board, Dr. Grover. I have before you tonight a request to advertise for bids for replacement of fire smoke dampers at the Prior Lake High School. This is an approved health and safety project. Um, we'll be having a mandatory walkthrough, so there should be no surprises to contractors. Um, and this work would be executed over the school year before um, June 30th. It would be completed before then. Do you have a, anything appropriate? Uh, just the advertisement you should have in your packet. Okay. I'm just trying to find it in my packet, that's all. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions? Anyone? No? Okay. Um, do I have a motion to approve uh, the bids for the high school fire and smoke damper replacement project? So moved. Rich, second? Second. Dan, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 4-0. Thank you. Okay, on to D, the student council report. Tucker. All right, so um, we just had a lot happen since the last time I was here. But um, the main thing is we had our homecoming week, which... Um, our theme was I'm so fancy this year, so we kind of based all of our dress-up days and everything off of that. And um, we had a very successful dance, very high attendance, um, mostly from the underclassmen. We noticed since the the um, the, um, the 700 student freshman class has actually affected us a lot. Um, we had our first outdoor pep fest ever, and it worked out pretty well because of the um, school. We have the um, scoreboard out there with the big screen on it, so we could show our video and everything there. And um, overall, everything went very smoothly, and it was very good. So, um, and then right after that, we hosted the uh, annual fall convention for Capital Division at our high school, and um, that's where 13 schools from around the state came, and we all just shared IG, shared ideas and um, discussed ways that we could improve our councils and our schools in general. And um, something else that has been going on since we've been doing uh, concessions at every football game that we've had at home, and that is where we make a majority of our money for the year. So that and homecoming have both gave us a lot of money, so um, that's, yeah, we, so we can kind of coast for a little while off of that, but um, we also have added seven new members to our council. Two of them are foreign exchange students, which is the first time we've done in a few years, but it's in our constitution, and we added five honorary members as of last Wednesday, and um, 
we right now we are working on a fundraiser um, for No Shave November, where we have a few of our teachers uh, are um, pledged not to shave if they if their students raise a certain amount of money, and so we're just doing that by week. And it, the first week it's gone very well so far, and so that's kind of where we're at right now. And coming up. Um, this Thursday, we are having our annual coffee house meeting where we go and discuss where we kind of what I'm discussing right now, like what we've done so far and where we're going to go from here. And so a lot of our upcoming plans will be figured out then. And um, one thing that we are planning on doing is this December, we are planning on having another dance or some sort of activity that would replace um, the Sadie Hawkins dance, which hasn't been as successful in the past years. So we're still, this Thursday we'll probably figure out what it will be, but it's, something's going to happen, so. And that's, yeah, that's where we are right now, so. All right, uh, next up, the organizational charge, Dr. Gruber. Thank you, Tucker. Um, <clears throat> each year we look at our organizational charts within our, our large organization. They're amended uh, to fit any kind of nuances or changes that have happened within our administration um, throughout our district. So the revised uh, templates are there uh, beginning on page 85. And no board action is requested. Okay. Questions? Anyone have any questions? Are there any differences, major differences you could point out from this year as compared to last year? I didn't. I, know I don't comp. know of any specifically well, from last year. Right. We had. And Jeff, you want to speak to that? Yeah, the Q comp would be one change. The tech integration specialist would be another change. Okay. Um, but largely, I think there were some title changes. I think as well. But for the most part, it's relatively similar to previous uh -huh. years. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next up is the couple proclamations. Um, the Optimist Youth Appreciation Week. Um, the board proclaims the third week of November as Youth Appreciation Week in Prior Lake Savage Area District. Uh, and I have to read this. Whereas the vast majority of youth are concerned, knowledgeable, and contributing partners within the community, and whereas the accomplishments and achievements of these young citizens deserve the recognition and praise of the community, and whereas Optimist International has since 1954 developed and promoted a program entitled Youth Appreciation Week, and whereas the citizens of Prior Lake Savage Area School District have indicated a desire to join the optimists in expressing appreciation and approval of the contributions of the youth of the District 719 Board of Education, does hereby proclaim the third week of November as Youth Appreciation Week in the district. By this action, let it be known that we have faith in the ability of today's youth as they assume responsible roles in the future of mankind. Now, therefore, I, Stacy Ruel, Vice Chair of the Prior Lake Savage Area Schools of Education, hereby proclaim the third week of November 2014 as Youth Appreciation Week in Prior Lake Savage Area District. Is that it, Martha? Do I have to? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, next is the American Education Week. And the school board will also proclaim November 17th through the 24th. Uh, 21st, excuse me, 2014, as the 93rd Annual Observance of American Education Week. Really? 93 years? That's amazing. Um, okay. Here's the proclamation. Whereas public schools are the backbone of our democracy, providing young people with the tools they need to maintain our nation's precious values of freedom, civility, and equality, and whereas by equipping young Americans with both practical skills and broader inte intellect abilities, schools give them hope for and access to a productive future. And whereas education employees, be they custodians or teachers, administrators or cleric staff, bus drivers or librarians, 
cooks or support staff work tirelessly to serve our children and communities with care and professionalism. And whereas our district, the community hub bringing together adults and children, educators and volunteers, business leaders and elected officials in a common enterprise. Now therefore the Prior Lake Savage Area School Board of Education does hereby proclaim November 17th through the 21st, 2014 as the 93rd annual observance of American Education Week. Okay. Um, do we want to move on to policy? Sure. Okay, we're going to move on to policy and we'll hit the technology plan when um, Todd comes. The first reading of policies. Um, let's see. Policy 613. Are you going to do this one, Dr. Yes. yes. Um, um, this is uh, the graduation early completion of requirements. Um, it's a very short policy, as you can see. We'd like to keep it as is for this year. Uh, the state is working on different tests to determine um, eligibility for graduation and all of that is moving. Although MSBA does have a template for the existing terminology, it's changing as we speak. So we'd like to keep it as is and then next year review it again. So this is the MSBA's this is their format, but these yeah. are our words. Okay. Theirs is about five pages long, okay. seven, five to seven. It's quite lengthy and detail and looks a lot more to us like procedures in some areas. Okay, and this is just a first read on this yes, one. It is. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, and then the second and final reading on six other policies. Yes. Um, we are determined to get uh, through all the policies that haven't been reviewed. Um, during Alicia Mick's term <laughs> these past uh, 11 years. So um, we have been working very hard. We actually had a uh, policy day where we had all of the policies that had not been reviewed before us in one day. I think we got up to 20 by the end of the day. Um, but these, is, these, these are uh, a few of the ones that are here for a second and final reading. More will be coming to you on November uh, no, November 17th and then December 15th. So um, we'll be bringing them all to you. They will all be have their final approval in, in January at the latest. But on these policies, you have seen them once. This is a second and final reading of policy 520 on student surveys, 902.1 on tobacco-free environment, 902.2 on drug-free workplace, 609 on religion, 903 on visitors and 607 on class size. I'd like to point out on policy 903 visitors to the school that we re did redo the wording on that um, policy under uh, responsibility. Um, we had some conversation about that if you'll recall at the first reading um, where we didn't feel like it was uh, a, a board role to have you review visitor procedures each year. Um, and so we changed it to read, uh, A would read, it shall be the responsibility of the superintendent to provide coordination of all visitor procedures and requirements published annually in each school handbook. Um, the, po the policies for visitors that are, is in place um, and then as long as the handbooks comply with that policy, it's meeting your needs. And then I would bring it back to you for review if anything should change or if there was something that we wanted to change within this policy. And then, one at a time? Or? Well, and then there was one other note on the verbal or electronic communication. Yes. We just added that, yeah. Um, how do you guys want to vote on this? Individually or? Do you have questions? Questions? We can do them. I make a motion that we have a single vote on all these second reading of the policy. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second it. Thank Okay. Any discussion on any of them? Okay. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes 4 0. Okay, I think. Now we do my report. Sorry. Now we have to. That was just a motion to take all five at once. Right? Okay. Now Sorry. do we have to vote? Okay. Up or down on the five. Thank you, Rich. Okay, so that was the motion to 
take them as a bunch of six. Now, do I have a motion to approve all uh, six of the policies listed? So moved. Rich, second? Second. Dan, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes 4-0. I think we can start. I think I think I think we'll um, start on the dist district technology plan C in there. So. All right. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, Dr. Groover, Mr. Malazzo, and shortly Mr. Sukup will be joining us uh, as part of the presentation this evening. This is a presentation that uh, uh, you looked at and, and reviewed two weeks ago at the last board work session. We did go through two components. One was the desktop refresh as well as uh, iPads moving forward. So there, there are some changes particularly to the iPad recommendation. So the overview this evening, uh, we're going to go through that desktop lease recommendation, give you a little uh, historical perspective on that. We'll go to the iPad update recommendation uh, for consideration, as well as the financials of that. And then we'll talk about moving forward pending approval of what the 2015-16 budget process would look like um, relative to staffing, curriculum adoption, and professional development, and the opportunity for you to have discussion and questions on the proposals that we have for you this evening. Our first proposal, and we're seeking approval, would be our desktop lease. Uh, we have a five-year equipment replacement plan. Uh, the plan would be to purchase the lease desktop computers for 1516 and re redeploy those computers into the student labs, K-8. Our current lease matures on 718-2015 for 950 desktops. We currently pay $200,000 per year to have uh, for this lease. We've made the last payment on 718-2014. And uh, if we pay an incremental amount of $182,134, uh, we can own this equipment. Um, that comes out to be a total cost uh, per unit of $824, which is what we buy computers now for on the, uh, on the market. So if we use uh, joint powers or some of the other purchasing uh, um, avenues that are available to us, that is the type of price we pay for a desktop computer now. Um, so what we would also propose is that we renew our three-year lease for $650, uh, 650 staff computers for next year as well. Uh, in reference to our tech uh, projects that have been board approved, the last year uh, the one-to-one -one iPad deployment uh, and uh, project was approved. Uh, 2014 and 15, which has now been completed, we have deployed 700 iPad minis for eighth grade students and 400 iPads through... Uh, E12 that comes out to be about 13 carts. Under this proposal that has been board approved, 1516, we were going to deploy another 700 iPad minis for eighth grade students and then continue with the cart theme and deploy another 13 carts, E12. And for 1617, same uh, 700 iPad minis for eighth grade and 400 iPads uh, in carts. Um, so at this point, we have uh, distributed uh, staff iPads to um, all staff members uh, last year during the 13-14 school year. Um, in, in conjunction with um, the 8th grade students receiving uh, their iPads this year, uh, they were required to complete a student ninja, uh, an iPad Ninja course, um, which kind of gave an overview of uh, what we expected kids to be able to know and show some level of competency when it comes to dealing with the iPad. Do they understand what a digital footprint is? Do they understand the implications of some of the things that they're putting out there? What does that look like? Um, how do they use the iPad effectively? So that happens at seventh grade, so that'll happen again this February with our seventh graders. They'll have an opportunity to pass those six tests as well. Um, we also created a, an iPad handbook um, for parents um, that was distributed and is currently resides on the tech integration page. Um, on the Prior Lake Savage website. Um, and then, of course, we had our iPad rollout night in August, which was very well attended. We had about 97% of parents and students attend that night. Um, out of the 700 um, potential students, we had 670 um, students, and we only had about 25 students not show up, which is, which, is really, uh, which is really encouraging. So we had parents come in, get information. Students went through the process and walked out with their iPad about two weeks before school started. We envisioned something similar to that this year. 
probably run a little bit smoother now that we've had a year under our belt and we kind of can anticipate what are some of the issues and some of the questions and make more things happen now that we have a better understanding as well of what the kids should have on the first day of school. Um, one of the big things that we've been working on is our SWAT team, um, which stands for Students Working to Advance Technology. Um, we take this very seriously. We have um, 30 eighth grade students currently that are part of our SWAT team. Uh, during their prime times at the middle school, they're available to answer questions and, and be our tech support. They're kind of our first line of defense of um, issues that come up throughout the day. Um, kids can bring it in there during the prime times, uh, answer questions. If they can't answer that question, then either myself or a media specialist or somebody that is a little bit more equipped to handle that will come in and, and solve those issues. But it's been really encouraging. The kids have taken this responsibility um, very seriously and have done a great job. Um, they have different color cases, so the teachers have also been calling on them in class because they know that if a student has a blue case, that's one of their SWAT kids, so they make sure that they're answering questions in class, not just during prime times. The hope is that elementary is looking at developing that as well, so we have those kids coming into the middle school down the road, and then the high school would look at that next year as we have the ninth graders next year coming in. What does that look like there? Because the prime time is not a piece that we have at the high school, so how does that look different? And what are the things that we need to get in place uh, for that to be successful at the high school as well? Um, currently, um, we've deployed about 670, or a little bit, those numbers have fluctuated a little bit more. I think we've only lost two students and gained about five or six during this year. Um, we also deployed um, additional carts at the high school and the middle schools this year, and then um, one additional cart at each of the elementaries, which are currently the elementary runs a little bit differently. For the majority of the schools, they had they took the original. 60 that we gave them last year and deployed that to grade level so every classroom has some iPads. However, now with the carts, now every building is looking at a cart model as well so they can also bring 30 in uh, to use in the classroom in addition to the two or three or four iPads that they already have in their classrooms. Um, and finally, the biggest piece, the biggest question is always, well, what's our infrastructure? What is the wireless access points? Can, how can we have 700 devices running successfully? So that's all been upgraded as well, and that will continue to be looked at um, through Meraki, through Cisco Meraki, to see what do we really need to have in place for um, the kids to be successful and get on um, the iPad uh, throughout the day. Another proposal that we are seeking approval is a uh, um, the one one iPad deployment. This is a new proposal that we are seeking approval on. Uh, it is a change from the the one that has been board approved. So I want to be clear on that. Okay. Uh, 2015 2016, we are proposing that we purchase two 2800 iPad minis for eighth grade, tenth grade, tenth through twelfth grade students. Um, that's a projected number of 700 students per grade level. We would take the existing high school carts and redeploy them to elementary buildings. We would take the existing middle school carts and redeploy them to 6th and 7th grade. Um, the goal would be by 15-16 that there would be 8 through 12, a 1 to 1 ratio, and K through 7, a 1 to 2 ratio. Do you have something to add, Mr. Owen? No, I think that this is a different proposal than what we originally had uh, shared with you two weeks ago. Uh, we were looking at a two-phase rollout, but it, uh, definitely more focused on getting to a one-to-one -one model at the secondary level. Um, you know, the, the projection of 700 students at a grade level, we currently do not have 700 students at all of our grade levels, um, but recognizing, too, that we are a growing district, you know, that, that we would have the ability to accommodate those needs should our enrollment get that high. Um, it is a more aggressive plan, but also, too, it, 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 do, it is able to address the needs from some of the things that we experienced this past year. As, as Mr. Sukup talked about, you know, the success of rolling it out, but also delving into the, the success of how teachers are using them with students. Um, when we're having curriculum review and talking about how we can bring curriculum to students, the previous board approved proposal was rolling that out. We did have some challenges with that. Um, you know, as, as teachers are talking about how do we have, how, can, how do we plan or look at curriculum over the next two years before students that come to me would have an iPad. So certainly this deployment and this uh, proposal with putting iPads in the hands of all the students at secondary level would shift how we do curriculum, how we would do teaching and instruction and assessment as well. The financial 
component of this. Uh, we do have the funds uh, for designation from the board out of technology, out of the two sources in capital, technology and innovation funding, as well as uh, we do have, we are proposing out of the general fund with cash flow reserves to round out uh, the remaining balance for a total of $1.2 million. Next steps, and again, this is pending board approval, what it would look like uh, for the rest of the year. And, and there is a bit of a uh, partial recommendation here too. We would be shifting how we look at our professional development for January 19th and early release. For our secondary schools, it would shift. It would be about iPads. It would be shifting about electronic curriculum um, and looking at really from, from December to August, the next um, nine months, preparing staff for rolling these out and learn and teaching with students having an iPad in their <coughs> hands. We would be looking at customized training sessions uh, at the middle school and also high school level, but to some extent also at the elementary. You know, redeploying those iPad carts down to the elementary, we will also need to focus on some training in that area as well. Looking at the 15-16 budget process, uh, we would be coming forward as part of that process with a recommendation to uh, and develop a 21st century curriculum adoption model, a model that is not uh, dependent or focused on textbooks, but looking at online sources and looking at teacher-created online sources. Uh, we would be re we would come forward with uh, with research and recommend technology and a professional development <coughs> staffing model as well. Uh, this many devices and uh, attention on doing things differently is going to mean we're going to have to, our old models may need to be shifted. And we may be looking at different staffing models or different ways to support staff, support students in rolling this out. One of the, one of the components I want to draw your attention to is, you know, it, pending approval again and moving forward, we may need some staffing for this year uh, to assist with that rollout, to assist with that, the, the proposal we're bringing forward. Um, the allocation of $50,000 is at this point to be determined, um, uh, but certainly prior to any expenses coming forward with a plan of how we would use those dollars in the current school year to roll out uh, this, the, uh, the proposal. And then largely communications. When you're looking at communications of a larger student body as well as with the parents and with the staff, um, having those communications moving forward because it, is going, it would be a shift um, for all students at the high school as well as uh, at the eighth, for the incoming seventh graders. And so we would build on the successes that we've had. Um, and I think Corey can speak to that a little bit, is really looking at how students at the high school would be part of this process, enrolling this out um, and developing many of the things we need for them to be successful with iPads and technology moving forward. And also looking at uh, models of communications with parents and community as well as how we would move forward and what instruction would be looking like with the devices. If there's anything you'd like to share on that regard in, in, as, a, as a whole. Well, I think we've seen a lot of success at the, at the middle school, which, which gives us um, great uh, ideas of what, what can happen at the high school. Um, you know, just simple examples that, that of ways that iPads are being used effectively are, you know, with our Schoology model being used, it, it's being used in lots of different ways in the classroom. Um, we're seeing kids creating their, their videos uh, and downloading it into Schoology or using Notability uh, to create um, projects and then downloading it into Schoology as part of their um, workflow process. So we're eliminating a lot of paper flow um, from teachers and, and kids are able to be more creative with what projects that they are using. In addition, we have our character ed, our, our second step program from guidance counselors at eighth grade level. Um, they are specifically created, they specifically created a Schoology course where the kids, because they know that they have the iPads, and they're gearing their lessons directly for that. So the kids are looking at the lessons there, they're submitting their comments um, and all their um, assignments within Schoology and it just makes that workflow so much easier. We don't have to worry about getting them to a computer lab and being, um, not having enough computers for all the prime times uh, throughout the day. So we're seeing effective ways that teachers are really starting to make this all come together. After one quarter of, of using them, they're getting a little bit more comfortable with that, what that looks like. And students are getting more comfortable with you know, how, what the teacher expectations are as well. So it really gives us a, a good idea of what it could look like and, and things that we'll be able to jump off with at the high, with the high school staff right away. Questions? 
questions and discussion. Questions? Um, regarding, you know, the ability to, for students to log on, we had one grade at the middle school. I mean, if we're, all of a sudden we're going to have four grades at the high school and potentially 1,500 students at once trying to get online. Are we, how is our, what's our capability like at the high school? Are we comfortable that we can, we can withstand that kind of load on a daily basis? That's an excellent question. We, uh, and we are working with our Meraki vendor right now, Sisulu of Meraki, to do a load balance test to make sure that the equipment we have in place can meet that load. Last year, we had did sign a new agreement for to expand our internet uh, bandwidth, uh, so that we we and our cooperative have uh, 10 gigs up and down. So that that will help quite a bit as far as that load goes when when they come in and uh, when they go out to look for information and when they're downloading information as well. Um, we do have a plan in place to saturate the secondary buildings with more access points. So after we work with our vendors and, and see that our existing equipment can handle the load, we do actually have a plan to add equipment as well. So it's twofold. We want to make sure what we currently have can withstand what we're doing now, but also be expandable for future growth. Uh, the one recommendation that a lot of the access point vendors will make is that you have an access point per classroom. Uh, we're, not, we're there at Hidden Oaks Middle School, but we're not quite there at Twin Oaks or the high school. So those are two areas that we would look at ex expanding and increasing access points. So we can know ahead of time, you know, worst case scenario, there's 1,800 kids at once trying to get, we can, without actually doing a test right. with 1,800 iPads, we can know confidently ahead of time that we have the capability. We are going to know before that. Before we uh, roll these out, we want to make sure that we're, we're built for current and future expansion. Because not every student is going to have, un, if it's board approved, they're going to have a school issued iPad. But what else are they bringing with them? Because we allow BYOD, so it's very possible they might have two or three other devices that are hitting our access. So count on as many iPads as we issue school wide or district wide, plus maybe two or three more. So we want to you know, take that into consideration as well. I have a phone and an iPad on me right now. There's two. Mm -hmm. So two is probably, you know. Average. Plus staff. Plus staff. So you know, we want to make sure that we, we have that, those capabilities. So again, load testing what our current equipment, um, looking to increase the access points. Uh, when we do upgrade, you know, when we increase access points, we make sure that the models that we're, we're acquiring are the latest. Um, the number of radios in an access point have a, uh, a huge impact on how many connections they can handle. More radios, more connections they can handle. Okay. Did I answer your question? I think so. Thank you. Mike. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I, I don't think that we've talked about this, or at least last time. I'm assuming the kids are keeping the iPads throughout their tenure, right? They're not checking them in at the end of the spring, right? But this will at least give us the opportunity at the end of next school year then for the next year's seniors to actually have to turn them back in. I'm assuming then the plan would be to verify they're all still functional, all that good stuff, and then would those be used for the following fall's eighth grade students? Correct. Okay. And that's going to be kind of the model then, right? They get turned in, the ones that are still adequate will get re, uh, recycled, if you will, right? Okay. Redeployed. Redeployed. There you go. Um, but yeah, so I uh, I appreciate you know um, you guys taking the uh, um, input from our last study session and, and looking at uh, how this could possibly work. One thing that we hadn't talked about then that even as I'm sitting here now I think is a positive um, is the social aspect of what we were going to be having next year would be the youngest kids in the building with the newest tool which. You know, at the middle school, the oldest kids have it, but you, you, you flash forward and it would be the youngest ones, which, you know, I, I'm certain that there probably would be some challenges with that, right? We, we all were in high school at one point. So I think that, that this will, I think, help alleviate some of those um, unintended consequences, which I, you know, so I think that's good. I know that uh, should the board approve this, which I certainly will be supporting it, um, there will be a lot of work because I know there's been a lot of work the last <laughs> couple of summers, but uh, so I appreciate you guys uh, taking the effort to look into not only financially whether or not it could be uh, accomplished, and I'm sure, sure, Julie, you were busy um, the last couple of weeks, 
um, but also just um, support wise um, what the effort would take to do that so I'm glad to see that uh, that it looks like it can be accomplished so thank you for uh, for the effort looking into that Rich. Uh, can you refresh from my memory again for me please the 1.2 million that you have down there uh, <clears throat> Will that cover, what does that cover? Cost of the device? Does that include the infrastructure upgrades that Marcus is talking about? Yes. Does that include the professional development, the additional professional development cost? The, the 50,000? Yes, that should cover some, that should cover that, but anything further, the 15, 16 budget, as far as additional or the restructure of the recommendation, that is not part of the 1.2 million. And what, then, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. What no. the 1.2 million does cover are the iPad minis, the cases, the infrastructure, additional access points. And the iPad minis that we're purchasing, the highest, I mean, the largest amount of uh, memory? Most amount. They're the baseline. Okay. They're the 16 gig model. Okay. And then we can go back to the desktop lease. Uh, what's the. Does this also cover that 1.2, the renew of the three year lease for the staff computers? That's a separate account. Okay. And that's not, that's just a continuing cost? Right. That's how it's currently set up, yes. But then the total cost for the computer labs, that's a new cost, a one time cost for the purchase of the $182,000 is a one time cost to okay. buy out the lease computers, mm -hmm. redeploy those to the, the K8 labs. Okay. And then the lease continues if board approved we, for 650 staff computers, which should be less than the 200,000 that we currently, because we've leased 950 computers. So um, okay. my assumption is, and my expectation is, that the lease cost will be less. Okay. And that, Julie, that 182,000 comes out of the existing current year? It would come out of current year capital dollars. Okay. <clears throat> that does it for me. Thank you. Mike? Following on, um, I think Rich, we were uh, on the board together when we talked about that 200, right? That the whole purpose of doing that was so that we didn't have kind of fall off the cliff every several years, right? And then have to figure out where were we going to get the money to cover replacing computers. So I think that now we've got that as sort of a baseline cost year over year over year, right? And, and so really, it truly is just the 182 that's incremental for this year. Yeah. And, and that may be something for the board to look at is if this is going to be a, you know, probably a regular every third year, maybe we should consider how we could kind of look at that then as we go forward too. But, you know, the, the 200 I think was a good thing for us to do several years ago because it kind of, I think, kept our costs known, right? Yes. And that's continued, has been in our budget and will continue to be in our budget as a baseline for our computers. Oh. And that puts us on a refresh cycle of every three years for staff computers, which is excellent. Yeah. And five years for student computers, which is great. Well, and it brings that new technology to the elementaries, which is directly needed right now. Yeah. So. Yep, that's correct. Dan, do you have anything? Well, I'm, I'm still a little concerned long range about the funding for the iPad. Um, not out past 15, 16. That's, that's my concern. I, the concept, even though it's a little more accelerated than I'm comfortable with, I understand and and am uh, maybe a little more reluctantly willing to support. But the long-range funding is still, uh, I'd still have to see some kind of a concept or a plan or an idea of how we do this. Maybe it's similar to what we did with the desktops. I don't, I don't know, but uh, I'd, I'd really like to see that. Um, I also um, am eagerly anticipating the capability to restrict, you know, social media uh, plan for that, how we're going to deal with that. And then I'd... Uh, I like to see an acceleration of the of the staff written curriculum, um, kind of kind of along the same lines we do with QComp. You took our some of our best teachers, put them in charge of some things. Um, I'd like to see our top some of our top teachers writing curriculum, and and putting us in a position where where we're using our own stuff and not and not having to purchase uh, down the road. That's those are my my concerns um, as, as far as this plan is is laid out. So. Um, I, I fully support it. I'm excited to be able to bring it to fruition um, at, for the high school and the secondary kids. Um, you know, I think Dan brings up a valid point that, you know, future-wise we have to look out and be concerned about <clears throat> the cost. But 
Um, I think we have a little time here. This will buy us some time to kind of to figure that out. Um, so I'm looking forward to it happening. Uh, a couple to carry on Dan's point. Um, I lost my train of thought here. Um, but the curriculum, what's the, what are you hearing from the teachers about their desire or their hunger to create their own curriculum? You know, initially, a, when they're looking at it, they're finding a lot of positives because it's, you know, they, they, they understand the standards that, that need to be taught. They're also understanding their students, and usually it's things that they've designed in previous years or they've worked together in previous curriculum writing experiences or through QCOM to develop those experiences for their kids. So in concept, it's very favorable. The thing is, it's time. It takes time to create it in a format that's like an iBook or, or, or an eBook that kids can use. And, and that's the one thing that, that, that comes across. They're, they're finding it's once we're using with students, students enjoy it. It's better fitting what we want the kids to learn, but it is taking time. Um, you know, and again, when you're thinking of creating things from scratch or having to redo things, it is going to take more time. You know, I think the time saving is going to be next year, you know, when it's already created and it just yeah. needs to be revised or tweaked. And so I think the initial, the initial, I guess, the curriculum writing or the development, there is going to have to be some attention to that. But I think ongoing, it's going to be more about revision um, and the creation is going to be more uh, relative to new standards or relative to new experiences that we want kids to have. I'll follow up one more time from Dan. I was very impressed by the report that you had about the traffic and the usage yeah. in the district. So and I think we, we can continue to make that tool available for staff and, and teachers. That'd be great. And then I look at this purchase as just we're starting um, a whole new trend. We don't sit and argue about how much whiteboards cost or funding whiteboards continually. And this was just a tool. The iPads are just a tool and it's common practice now for in the classroom so I am happy to report out that last time we looked at that report that at the work session we had a device that was a really high-end user that was one of our servers so I'm happy to report <laughs> that that was not I don't have to have a conversation with anyone it's okay. a machine that's supposed to be doing that so I wanted to report back and let you know that <laughs> so. the report will be um, useful for the community to show our community that our kids aren't just on FaceTime and Snapchat. They're actually using it for... It's a yeah, very useful tool, so... Purposes. One, one Any, uh, 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 um, <clears throat> I would just like to uh, underscore what Dan, you know, because I think Dan brings up a good point that we just need to make sure as we go into the budget cycle like we did for the, you know, the least stuff that we say this is something that we as a district are committed to and let's make it part of the core budget again so that we don't have to then search for the dollars later on. Right. If we really feel this is important, we, we need to make it part of the core budget and, and make sure that it's not something that, you know, in three or four or five years we're like, ah, oh, shoot, we don't have the money to, to do it. So um, if that means that we need to, um, you know, take from somewhere else, then maybe we need to do that. But, you know, again, we saw earlier tonight the audit, and again, not that we want to ever get back to where we were, but we've done a really great job over the last couple of years, and, and I think that there probably should be enough headroom in there for us to uh, find a way to do this. Right, Julie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I too support it and uh, stopped in and talked to Julie before the honored gentleman here uh, were in, I guess, today. So I hope you had some success. Um, I talked with Sue Ann and we thought, you know, we can do this now. I think it's the right thing to do. And, and looking forward on Dan's point is what is going to be in the next three years? And that's a real question of, of were, uh, three years ago when I joined the board, did we expect this? Did we know about this? Probably not, but what's the newest technology at that three-year point? And I think Dan's right. We need to come up with a plan. I think we have the right team to do that, and I think we'll move forward. I'm going with Mike to to echo the sentiments that there were a lot of expenditures that were cut, and uh, we're starting to bring back some of those now. So we appreciate that. So. Well, it's the it's the new normal. Sure. New normal. So. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, do I have a motion to accept? the district plan and the iPad update proposal. 
So I'll make the motion. I'll second. By Mike, second by Stacy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, administrative reports. Sue Ann. Yes. Um, our election results are in. Congratulations to Todd and Stacy and Rich uh, for your re election to the board. And we look forward to welcoming Melissa Enger and Ben Hansen to our board in January. So, congratulations to each of you. And uh, we will be missing Lee Ashimik and Mike Murray, who did not seek re election and have served our district well for many, many years. And thank you, Mike, for coming back and helping us fill that uh, partial term of Tom Anderson when he moved away. We'll be recognizing both Mike and Lee at a short reception on December 15th at 6 p.m. just before our board meeting that night. Um, just a little, little reception just to say thank you uh, so everyone is welcome to attend at that time. Um, thank you to kids, uh, to our community education for providing and coordinating the kids voting this year. It was a very successful event and campaign. There were over 1,153 total votes this year from our students in Prior Lake Savage and in the townships. Votes are tabulated and you can see the results on our website. Um, we have a new marketing video for La Ola de Lago, our Spanish immersion school. You can see it on YouTube at uh, Prairie Lake Savage Area Schools, or you can link it from our website. It's our latest marketing video, and uh, it is really quite, quite good. I think you'll enjoy it if you haven't seen it already. Um, it was well received with si just over 600 views in just its first week on our YouTube channel. We hope this will give families who are getting ready to register their kindergarten students some insights about our district's newest program. And this week is our uh, Kindergarten Live, and we will have it both at the elementary schools as well as at La La De Lago. Um, so we'll be interested to see our, how many parents come, come to see what's happening over at Edgewood School. Uh, we're very pleased with the marketing video. Um, veterans that were at Prior Lake High School on Friday to help celebrate uh, Veterans Day uh, and I had the opportunity to go over and visit with them uh, and it was um, it was really quite moving to know that our veterans are willing to come in and talk to our high school students and how much it means to our veterans as much as it does to our students. And one of the comments that they made to me was that um, some of these students have never met a veteran in their lifetime. At, at the age of 17 or 18. They're, they don't have a, a veteran in their family uh, or in their neighborhood or in their social sphere. So this was a really important opportunity that happens for juniors. The teachers were telling me that the seniors have also said, could we have them come back? We have, we have more questions for them. And uh, they have promised they would be willing, more than willing to do that. Um, it, uh, it was a, a really, uh, a fun way to be able to recognize them on Friday uh, while they were having their lunch to hear their reactions to our students. So this was um, more than the 20th year that our veterans have been coming to Prior Lake High School. And uh, it's a point of pride for me that our veterans take time to do that and are recognized by our schools for the um, outstanding efforts and work that they've given to our country. So um, we should all feel proud uh, that that happens. On another note, our Blue Jeans Ball, our first annual Blue Jeans Ball, uh, benefiting our Laker Educational Foundation, was a big success. It was held at Green Acres Event Center in, in Eden Prairie. Um, the financials are still being tabulated, but already there's been a lot of positive feedback, and the foundation is, is already making plans for next year's fundraiser. So I think many of you sitting here tonight were there and, and enjoyed it and, uh, and saw that it was really benefiting our foundation, which is giving most of its money back to our schools and district, although some of the money goes to our community. Uh, a large majority of it seems to come right back to our teachers doing innovative things and in, within their classrooms and in their buildings. So uh, we are very happy to participate in that and to see it be a positive success for our community. And of course, weather, weather, weather um, it has started again um, to uh, be perplexing. Um, so just for your information, uh, we did not have school today, as you know, so it wasn't an issue for us, although our surrounding uh, communities were looking at the weather mostly north of the river. Uh, that's where the snow is ending up, although we were, of course, alerted that it was going to be happening here. Uh, we're getting more of the rain and ice 
here than um, than we did the snow. But um, we will continue to do the same format that we have in the past. Uh, Jim Delwell and team will be out uh, driving the roads early in the mornings if there is a, a even an indicator of one kind of um, school um, related either closing or late start and we will make a decision and get on the phone into the TV stations by 6 a.m. But generally our goal is by 5.15 we make a decision and the voice uh, mail goes out um, and hits every electronic device you have sometime between 5.30 and a quarter of 6 a.m. So that's in case there is a, a late start or a school closing. Last year we had a record number of school closings and no, I'm not planning on having that happen again. Um, but uh, I also can, uh, give my um, whole ability to make decisions to the weather gods because uh, I have no control over these kinds of conditions that we had last year. But we really have that chart that we post on our website about that 25 degree below zero. Um, that's that's kind of a marker for us or 40 degrees uh, wind chill when those two collide We we have problems now. We don't see that happening this week We see some snow and ice and what have you so I don't think that's imminent, but uh, we will be uh, We're actually right now putting together uh, a listserv for our parents reminding them of the of those those two parameters that we use and also the safety 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 of our students and our buses and our bus drivers uh, that we're not putting people in peril when we put our buses on the road so our bus owners together with Jim Dowell um, do the the drive around uh, I'm talking to the different districts that we uh, that boundary on our boundaries that go all the way up to Eastern Carver County and on um, the west side and on the east side up to 196 so Together, we're looking at the changing conditions as they're impacting our communities and making decisions that best meet the needs of our unique district, but also in coordination with our neighbors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Minister of Reports, Julie. Jeff, good evening. None. Any board reports? I have one. We did have a district curriculum advisory committee talked about ADSIS. Uh, update on the world's best workforce and reviewed some high school and middle school courses that will be coming to the board here in the near future. Okay. Had a marathon policy session. Yes, we did. So we alluded to it earlier, but okay. um, yeah, we got 20 policies coming your way. So. Fun. It was a great uh, day. We're looking for volunteers for the policy committee next <laughs> yeah. uh, time around. I didn't, all the hands just shot up. I saw that. Yeah. So, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, anything else? We'll move on to uh, future events. We have uh, the board study session on November 17th at 6 p.m. here at the District Service Center. The uh, 19th is Youth, youth Appreciation Lunch, uh, which board members are invited to at Fong's if you can attend. Um, November 26th through 28th is uh, no school to the Thanksgiving break. Uh, busy early December, December 1st, Board Scholar Night, um, Prior Lake High School. Um, please uh, let me know if you cannot attend. Um, it's one of our board functions that I think is very important. Uh, with that, we have the uh, data retreat, and uh, it's on the 6th. Uh, I'm sorry, the 8th. Oh, by the 8th is the open forum for the uh, 21st century uh, workforce at the District Service Center, and then uh, the regular board meeting on the 16th. 15. I'm sorry, 15. I'm <laughs> ahead of myself here. Oh, um, with the truth and taxation meeting uh, at the beginning of the meeting. So, with that, uh, is there any other business? Seeing none, do a motion to close the meeting? I move. Or adjourn the meeting, actually. By Dan, second. Second. By Stacy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That carries 5 0. Thank you. Thanks for filling in. Appreciate the. Uh, you got lots of stuff to sign. Go, go. Yeah. <laughs> so you have lots of